Right, hello and welcome back to another video. So this week we're going to be having a look at little tiny particles uh, and the smearing you get with them. Uh, we're going to have a look at the causes uh, and then we're going to have a look at a couple of solutions and we're going to get a little bit into the sort of technical side of what's happening under the hood, um, most of which I am able to explain. There's one thing I'm not quite sure about, but we'll, we'll cover that as well. And maybe if you've got any ideas about what's actually happening there and you can let me know in the comments, that would be great. Um, but yes, we have here a particle effect uh, spawning lots and tiny little dots. Uh, I'm not sure how well that's going to come through in the video. Um, but if we select it, we can see there's lots and lots of tiny little dots there. But if I just deselect it a second, we can see particles close to the front of the screen here when they get bigger, because they're closer to us, they're going to appear bigger on the screen. But here in the background, they're very, very faint, um, just kind of like a hint of little movement. It's quite stuttery and, and it's really not very good. Um, you get this all the time with embers, sparks, little tiny magical dots and glows, anything like that, where the particle itself is very small. Um, and what's happening? Well, it's the temporal um, anti-aliasing, or in this case, temporal super sampling. Um, basically, the engine is taking multiple frames worth of data uh, and blending them together to get nice, smooth, crisp edges um, in the anti-aliasing. And because of that, these things which are tiny and moving very fast, are creating problems. And you can see a little ghosting occasionally where they cross the grid lines and stuff. Um, really not very good. So if we have a look in the engine settings, uh, project settings, sorry. Uh, if we go to the rendering tab down here in engine, rendering and typing alias. Uh, default for Unreal 5 is TSR or temporal super resolution. Um, and that's kind of required for any of the advanced features. So Nanite and Lumen um, both require or at least I believe they require um, this to be, be enabled. So um, we can look at some of the other ones. So temporal anti-aliasing. This is the um, kind of Unreal 4 approach. Um, get a little bit of it. It's slightly better. Um, we're still kind of losing the, the dots in the distance here though. Um, and that's, yeah, not, not ideal either. Um, we have two other ways here. FXAA, you can see here is set for the mobile version. Um, we get our dots back, but if we have a look at any kind of triangular line, if you look across the top here, at the top of the wall, there's definitely some sort of jagged edges. Again, may not come through in the video, but do try this out yourself. Um, not a very good solution, but now we can see our, our particle dots. Uh, and then the last one is multi-sample. Um, and that's kind of even worse. We can really see the jagged edges on these diagonal lines. You can see the top almost looks like kind of stepped bricks Again, not sure how well that's going to come through in the video, but um, but those are the four options we have for um, anti-aliasing, um, sampling multiple pixels, blending them together, sampling multiple pixels through through time, um, or the temporal super resolution. What it does is it uses parts of the render buffers are, are downscaled and then upscaled, and that allows it to be quicker. Not everything needs to be rendered at full screen. You can render things at half res and quarter res and, and upscale things. Uh, and that's what temporal, simple, temporal super resolution is doing. Uh, obviously there is some um, good documentation around TSR um, on their website if you wanna read more about it. Um, but basically it's yeah rendering parts of the frame um, smaller and then rendering things up. Uh, and it's required or it's recommended at least, I'm not sure if it's actually required, required for uh, for Nanite and Lumen, but but those are things we want to use. One of the advantages of Unreal 5 has the, all these powerful uh, tools. And so we're going to stick with TSR, uh, but how can we fix it? Well, if we leave it on TSR for now, um, if we open up the material, if you've been working with Unreal 4 for a while, you might remember this setting. Uh, if we type in AA, there's a setting here called responsive anti-aliasing. Uh, and if I enable that and just apply, uh, and have a look. Uh, basically, nothing much happens. Um, this used to be a good fix for Unreal 4. Um, and if I change my anti-aliasing back to the Unreal 4 way, the TAA, actually, this is quite good. Um, kind of do a, trying to do a side-by-side -side comparison here. Uh, so here we have the responsive AA on, on the TAA setting, and then responsive AA off. Um, much harder to see the little dots in the distance or in the uh, against the wall, the further ones once they're smaller, and it's much better. Um, but that doesn't work for TSR. 
Now, if I change it back to TSR, the difference between the responsive AA and not having responsive AA enabled doesn't really make any difference. Um, so we're not going to use that. Doesn't seem to work. Instead, what we're going to do is with this thing here, output velocity. Um, so it's a setting in translucency. Uh, so we're using a translucent material, or I believe an additive as well. Uh, that's what I'm using here. Uh, and we'll use the same translucent settings. Um, we're going to output velocity. And what it says here, translucent materials will output motion vectors and write to depth buffer in velocity pass. And if we enable that and just apply, instantly we can see a lot more of these things. Now we are getting a little bit of kind of these stamping. Um, little trails. Now I don't think we can get rid of those as it currently stands. If I turn on responsive AA or turn off responsive AA again, it doesn't seem to make any difference to um, to when we're using the TSR uh, settings. But if I jump over to Photoshop, I have here comparison. Maybe it's a bit easier to see uh, with static frames but not in motion. So uh, using the TSR folder here, so this is the TSR post process setting, uh, with nothing you can very vaguely, faintly see little white lines and smearing in the background. It's not very good. Responsive AA, again, does nothing really for the TSR settings, um, but the velocity settings, um, everything small is much better. We are getting now these kind of stampy trails. So we've kind of changed one problem for another. Um, and again, having both on doesn't do anything. So, um, or doesn't do any extra. So the responsive AA here, not doing anything in the TSR settings. But if you're in Unreal 4 still and you're using TAA, then you want to use the responsive AA. That does make a big difference. Um, but the velocity write also works as well. So just because you're using TAA doesn't mean you can't use the, the velocity write as well. OK, that's fixed. But that unfortunately has created its own problem. Um, if we just go into our particle system, uh, small particles. Uh, and then we ignore the name and we take our small particles and make them very large particles, um, we will see there is a problem. Now, using a um, translucent or additive material, where we have collision, not collision, but where we have kind of uh, penetration with uh, opaque geometry, we generally want to use some sort of fade to get rid of that. Um, and if we go into our material here, usually we'll use a depth fade. Uh, and if I just make sure that this is not writing to velocity and apply this, and I can then multiply in my depth rate, and we'll see what happens. So here um, we're getting hard edges. If I click apply, now we're getting nice soft edges. So the way depth fade works is it uses the pixel depth and the scene depth, and it uh, subtracts one from the other. Uh, and we'll go over this in a minute. Um, um, but basically, it does some maths. It knows where the pixel being rendered is. It knows where the, the depth of the scene is. And um, because you've got those two points of data, you can do some comparisons, and you can get this nice soft edges. And that, that's great. Um, <clears throat> but if I put output velocity on, we immediately get an error. Translucent materials with output velocity enabled will write to the depth buffer. That makes sense. That's what it says in the tooltip. That's what we want it to do. Uh, but therefore cannot read from the depth buffer at the same time. So this depth fade now no longer works. Now, if your particles are only tiny, like so, maybe that's fine. Maybe we don't need the depth fade. Um, we can get away with that. But if our particles are bigger, um, or you just want to have, I don't know, maybe you're doing like a, a close up at some point um, and you want to see these these sparks going through and yeah, I don't know. Um, maybe we want to be able to fix this. Uh, how can we do that then? Well, this is where um, I tried this and it worked, which I was surprised by. So we'll get into this. So so what does depth fade actually do? Well, I described it a minute ago. It takes the scene depth of the scene. It takes the pixel depth, which is the depth to the pixel being rendered, uh, compares the two by subtracting, and then just divides by a value for a scale value. And if I swap my depth fade for this little load of nodes, uh, just turn on output velocity, we should see absolutely nothing when I apply this, or at least absolutely nothing different, because um, it's doing the exact same thing. Here we've just used the sort of first principle nodes instead of um, the inbuilt uh, node here. Now, I say it's right into the scene depth. If I go in here and look at my buffer visualization scene depth, we can see our depth 
has um, has the geometry in it, but not the particles. So anything translucent doesn't automatically write to depth. If I enable the depth rates, obviously I can't use this anymore. Let's just take that out for now. Um, we'll see what our particles are now in our depth buffer. Now that makes sense. That's what we want. Now the way of accessing the depth buffer, the way we've done it here with scene depth, this doesn't work. Um, but we can also access it through the scene texture. Now these are designed for um, sort of work with post-process materials and it allows us to get access to any of the parts of the material um, of, the, of the buffer um, through through the scene texture. So taking the texture that's been written um, and then accessing that and we can do things like change the metallic or change I don't know anything in the post process, all sorts of post process stuff, um, all access here through the through the scene um, scene texture node, uh, and one of them is scene depth. There we go, scene depth. Now, when I tried this, I assumed this would not work. Um, it compiles, that's fine, but I assumed what it would be doing would be comparing the uh, the values in the depth buffer. And the values in pixel depth, they should be the same because this particle should be writing to scene depth. Um, but it's not, so it works. So that's a fix. Um, rather than using the scene depth node itself, if we write our own depth fade using scene depth um, scene texture node instead, um, that will work. That will give us a nice soft fade. Um, and so, again, I'm not quite sure why. Um, but let's have a dig in a bit more about what's actually happening here. So I've got two different uh, materials. Uh, if I might unhide this plane. Um, I have here a plane. And this plane has a material assigned to it. And that is doing what the depth fade was doing. So it's taking the scene depth, um, scene texture, and I've just divided it by a value to make it um, the scale kind of correct for, for the scene, uh, and then saturated so I'm only getting zero and one uh, sort of clamping the values. Um, so this is showing me here, and it's just assigned to a plane, and you can see the depth here, there's definitely some flickering happening. There's definitely something happening in the particles affecting this, but it's not really showing the particles in the depth in the same way as the depth buffer is. So for some reason, scene depth, this here, which I thought was what was being written to the scene texture isn't quite exactly the same, uh, and that's why we're kind of able to do this um, to do this solution. Um, but I'm not entirely sure why. If we go back to oh, lit mode, um, if we assign our scene texture as a thing in a material to a non-post-process material, presumably it's writing a different depth buffer. Um, and we're able to access that instead because if I take the same setup, so exact same material, say here scene depth divided by a value, in this case it's a post-process material domain, and I apply this as a post-process volume or as a material in post-process, now I get access to the depth buffer that does include the particles. So there must be two slightly different depth buffers depending on whether it's being accessed as a post-process material or as a um, scene texture in a non-post-process material. So if anyone has any more information about that and can and sort of shed any light into what's happening here, um, we're definitely getting some flickering. That's interesting. But um, but because of this sort of disparity between the two depths, so the two scene texture depths, depending on what was used, um, we can use the trick. We can use the scene texture here um, to do the same calculation as depth fade was doing. But in this case, because this scene texture scene depth node doesn't have the depth that the particle's written, um, it's able to then do that comparison and get you the soft edges uh, that you might want. So um, definitely works, which is interesting. Uh, the other thing that it is writing is velocity. And if we go to the velocity, the, this is the, the velocity. Um, and you can see that's, that's what it's using to then kind of calculate where the pixels moved from and that helps to fix the smearing. And so that's really the bit of information we want. Uh, I'm not sure why you have to have depth and velocity at the same time. Presumably it's to do with other things smearing. If you were writing velocity but not depth, you might find that you are smearing the background by the foreground and something weird. So um, 
I'm sure there's a good reason for that, um, but I'm not sure the difference between these two things. If I select the plane, and, and it's just completely flickering here as well. Really interesting. Um, so the other option we have, um, if I just go back to my TAA fix, um, the other option we have is not to use any kind of depth calculation at all. Uh, if you've done any work with particle collisions, especially GPU particle collisions, you'll know that you can collide with the depth buffer, but you can also collide with the distance field. And so another way of working out how far you are away from something in the scene is to do a comparison with the distance field instead. So um, if I go in here and just turn on visualize global distance field, and I'll just hide my particles for a second. Uh, the global distance field, each mesh is writing into it, um, and you get a good representation of where everything is. Um, depending on the quality you've set, you can control how closely that matches. That's obviously not uh, oops, very well um, matched there. Um, but this is also something we can access through our materials, um, and that's what this is doing here. So rather than doing a depth-based calculation with scene depth entirely, we can do a complete comparison. This is what I was expecting to have to do because um, I was expecting this not to work, but for some reason it did. It's always a nice surprise. Um, but same idea. So we're checking how far the pixel of the particle is to the nearest surface. If its distance is zero, it's on the surface. Well, that's fading out to black. If it's now 100 units away, it's going to fade to one, and then we don't want any values over one or um, or below zero. So we're just clamping that out. Uh, and if I unhide my particles and go back to turning off the global distance field, what we can see is it's doing the same thing again. So it's giving us that soft fade. Um, so uh, another alternative to uh, to depth fade is you can do mesh distance field fade. Or yeah. Um, or we can just use the scene texture, which shouldn't work, but does, which I don't understand. And there we are. Um, that said, with this effect, you probably wouldn't want your material to be writing to uh, the velocity buffer unless it was required. Um, and it's only really required on small pixels, and if it's on really small, sorry, small particles, and if it's on a small particle, then maybe it doesn't need to have any depth fade anyway because obviously all of this stuff is adding costs and um, performance that maybe isn't necessarily giving you much uh, visual impact for very small things. But nice to know how to fix it if you need to. Um, cool. All right. Hopefully that has been interesting. Um, hopefully fixing all your little smearing particles uh, will be a, uh, be a good thing. Um, <clears throat> as always, big thank you to my patrons. Uh, thank you for supporting the channel. Um, and if you want to learn more about materials and VFX and tech art, uh, do check out my courses on Gumroad and Udemy. We've got four courses on materials and one on particles out at the moment and the new more, more particle stuff uh, coming soon as well. So uh, do go and check all of that out. Um, yeah, hope that's been interesting uh, and I'll see you all next time.